I interviewed 12 mega millionaires a few years back, um, one billionaire and everybody, all 12 of them had to start with nothing and they had to have earned at least $200 million. So I interviewed all these people and after about the third interview, I'm thinking, you know, they say it in a different way, but they have, they have about five to six traits in common. Thank you so much, Jim, for joining us on Pivot Me today. Hey, my pleasure, April. Great to be here. Yes, we are excited to get into it. So I know that you've got so much value to add to the pivoters, but before we before we begin on the strategies and the tips and the things that you've learned uh, through the years, I would love us to go back and talk about how it all began. So we were talking offline about you know your family moving around a lot and picking cotton together, and then that evolved into eventually working in a gas station. But can you quickly walk us through sort of where it all began, and then we'll catch up to where we are today. Well, uh, first of all, I love the uh, the pivot idea because I've had to pivot many times in my life. So yeah, right. I understand what people go through when they have to pivot and things change like they have changed recently even. So, uh, but, you know, looking back on my life, um, sometimes it's almost unbelievable to me that, that I started where I did and ended up where I am because I never planned it. It just kind of evolved into what I'm doing. But, you know, my first job actually was picking cotton. And I was six years old, and probably my parents would maybe get arrested for child abuse today if they did that. But, you yeah. know, we, the whole family did. We had to because we had to eat and we had to buy school clothes and that type of thing. So, and what I, what I gained from that, though, looking back on it, uh, is it was really, really hard work. I mean, backbreaking work, even at six years old. And, and I did that up until I was about 12. But I learned that hard, just hard work alone, working with your two hands. Now, some people love doing that, but it's not going to get you ahead financially. Uh, it'll maybe give you a job and make a living, but I wanted more than that. And, and I didn't know what I wanted at, at six and 12 years old. And then about uh, halfway through the 10th grade, I dropped out of high school. And I was not a good student at all. And I went to work in a gas station. I got married at 18. I had my first child at 19, worked in that gas station for about two years. And I made a dollar an hour and I worked 60 hours a week, no overtime. So I took home $52 and 10 cents a week. And, and I lived on that, you know, it was, you know, it was way back. <laughs> and, uh, and then, uh, my dream job was working in a factory on the assembly line, but I didn't have a high school diploma. And just by chance, uh, a fellow that had been into the gas station many times getting gas, we struck up a conversation. I found out he was a supervisor at the factory. And long story short, he said, look, if you can pass a test, I'll get you by that uh, high school diploma and, and we'll you can go to work in the factory. So I did. And there were 9,000 employees. And within six months, I was rated number one employee in the whole factory. Out of 9,000. Yeah. <laughs> and you might have uh, made some enemies there, Jim, when you did that. <laughs> no, we all had, we all got uh, rated as a, an a efficiency rating. So they gave you a certain job to do mm -hmm. uh, where telephone switchboards. Um, and they'd give you a certain job to do in a certain amount of time to do it. So if you did it in half the time, then your efficiency was 200%. Mm -hmm. well, but my best month was 457%. So wow. I did the job of 4.57 people. So they loved me. I bet. And, and, and other people were involved in kind of a little bonus pool and things that we had. Uh, and they loved it too, because it added to their bonus, because we're kind of all collectively in that. So anyway, my life changed one night, I was working a swing shift, I got off at midnight. And a fellow walked by my area that I uh, actually I've met a couple of times, didn't really know him that well. And he stopped and he said, hey, hey, Brett, he said, you're going to work in this factory the rest of your life. I'm going, I don't know, maybe. And he said, come go to this meeting with me tomorrow night. It's your night off, right? And I said, yeah. And I said, what kind of meeting? And he said, well, I think it's something we could do to make some extra money. And I said, well, what is it? And he said, I don't know. They just told me to bring somebody with me. I said, well, I'm not your guy. I'm not going to go to some meeting. I don't know what it's about. And he said, come on, man. He said, I need to take somebody with me. He said, I tell you what, if you go, I'll buy the beer afterwards. 
I said, well, what time is that meeting? <laughs> so, <laughs> I'm in. The beer, not the meeting. But little did I know it was going to change my life. Um, and without getting into all the details, I uh, you know, went to the meeting. A light went on in my head. And I said, I can do this. Not only am I going to do it, I'm going to get rich doing it. Hmm. Not even know what rich was. Probably two bucks an hour to me back then. But I wanted to get rich. And, and I saw an opportunity to really get ahead financially there. And they gave me my first, uh, first tra only training, actually. He said, your job is talking to people. If you talk a little, you'll learn a little. If you talk a lot, you'll learn a lot. And I said, well, how much is a lot? He said, 10 a day. I said, that's what I'll do. And of course, we didn't have internet or anything like that. So I had to physically go out and meet 10 people a day. And I did for the next year. 3,650 plus people. And I had that many people that told me no. And at the end of that year, I had lost everything I owned, my home, my cars, my furniture, everything. I'm standing in my kitchen, looking out the window. I got a wife and a child. And I look to one side and I see the note on my, my uh, door, uh, on the front door. And it was from the sheriff. And it says, you have to be out in five days by order of the sheriff. Because my home had been foreclosed. I had no place to go. I look to the left, my driveway, where I used to have two vehicles. Both of those are gone. They've been repoed. And I reach in my pocket and I have 15 cents. And that was all the money I had to my name. I had 15 cents, five days. I had to be out, wife and a child, no place to go. And I wouldn't quit. My dad showed up actually. And he said, he said, what are you doing? He said, you, 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 you could go back to the factory. They'll hire you back. And I said, dad, I can't. He said, what do you mean you can't? And I said, I can't go back. I just can't quit. And I didn't know what I was going to do. And the next life-changing moment for me that really took me off in, um, in an incredible direction was a fellow knocked on my door that same day from the company that I was working with. And he spent two hours with me sitting in my floor because we had no furniture. And he taught me what I was doing wrong and what I needed to be doing. So real and, quick, so did he know that you were in this position, that you were at this huge crossroads of... Well, I, to I told him. Okay. He said, tell me where you are. Yeah, I understand you're a hard worker and you're making no money. And he said, tell me what you do and wh what you're doing and all this stuff. And so I filled him in on everything, including my foreclosure that he saw on the note, note on the door anyway. And, um, and so he taught me a, a couple of things. And my business took off like a rocket <laughs> and and within within five days and we won't have time to go into all the detail but within five days uh, my business took off i had a vehicle to drive i had a three-bedroom furnished apartment i had three hundred dollars a week coming in and a, a second opportunity presented to me so all of it happened within five days so and, did he orchestrate some of this or was it no, the advice that he provided you were able to make this huge sharp pivot it was only it was only the, the advice he gave me for the business mm -hmm. uh my my next month that uh that i was going into i made twenty six hundred dollars and the one after that i made six thousand it just kept going up wow and within a year uh i had earned my first million dollars so from being dead broke a year of failure to uh, earning my first million in my second year. Wow. And, you know, what he taught me and, I, and probably would be valuable here. Um, he asked me first, he said, how do you know if you have a viable prospect? Mm -hmm. And I said, I don't know, I guess if they buy from you. And he said, no. He said, how do you know if they're even a potential to buy from you? I said, I have no clue. And he said, mm -hmm. well, obviously. <laughs> Evidenced, as evidenced by your numbers. <laughs> yeah. He said, he said, in order to have a, a viable prospect, you have to arrive at three destinations. And I said, what, what does that mean? He said, well, first of all, do they have a pain or a problem? Mm -hmm. Secondly, do they want to solve it? And third, can you solve it? He said, yes. so you got to find out if they have a pain or a problem to start. And I go, well, how do you find out that? And he said, well, it's not out there flapping your jaws like you've been doing for the last year. He said, you got to ask questions and listen. Mm -hmm. So what kind of questions? He said, it doesn't matter. I'm going, 
really? <laughs> I said, I'm confused. Mm -hmm. He said, no, it doesn't matter. He said, you want to start a conversation. Mm -hmm. You're having coffee and a guy sits down next to you. You say, do you work around here or something? Get us get mm -hmm. into a conversation with people. Sure. You're at a party. You know, what brings you here? Who do you know? Um, you know, wherever you meet people on an airplane, where you headed it, uh, today. Mm -hmm. um, so he said, you just get into conversation. He said, they'll share their pain and problem with you. Just get if curious. You mm -hmm. truly are listening. Mm -hmm. And he said, if you'll live your life this way, he said, I'm going to give you a tip here. And, and I've done this. I've lived my life this way since that day. He said, every time you meet somebody, no matter whether it's about business or you're on an airplane or at a party, it doesn't matter. You meet somebody new, always be thinking, what can I do to help this person? Mm -hmm. And he said, if you're always thinking that, he said, you'll never be without friends, without money. And he said, you'll build a network worldwide one day. And wow, this was the I same guy that was at your house that sat on the floor for two hours. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So Jim, what I'm hearing is that ultimately it was a mentor that came in and that was the catalyst for the the change one time never saw him since never saw so yes. fascinating the timing of that is amazing um you know it's interesting i want to go back to a, a original point so the, the first person who trained you said if you talk if you talk a little bit you'll learn a little if you talk a lot more you'll learn a lot more i, I might be paraphrasing there yeah. i wonder how different the results would have been if he would have said if you listen a little <laughs> you'll learn if you listen more you'll learn more um just a trick in sales we got to listen but um so Jim, I, I want, I want to talk about what happened after that, but I'm, I'm imagining this day in your house. I'm imagining the, the furniture's gone, the cars are gone, the sign on the door, wife and baby there, your dad came and, and, you know, pushed you towards the factory, obviously. But I mean, what was your, what were the people around you saying? I mean, your wife and I mean, you had to be under intense pressure to just go back to the safe, secure factory job. Yeah, my my wife was was very stressful because you know uh, she wanted security and sure. I wasn't providing that. It was about to lose even the roof over our heads, and you know family was always looking at me like, "What are you doing? You know, mm -hmm. this, this is ridiculous. You're never going to make it. You're not going to be successful." All the people I worked with in the factory uh, that were my friends, sure. That uh, actually the only friends I had, you know, I didn't, didn't work outside there or meet hardly anybody other than family. Mm -hmm. They all kind of put me down and said, you know, they laughed at you. Oh, Britt's going to be a millionaire. Yeah. Ha, ha, ha. You know? and mm -hmm. So it, it, I, I don't know. I, maybe I, part of it, I think drove me to show people that I could do it was okay. one thing, but, I, but I think I was inspired to do more, more with my life than wire telephone switchboards. I just didn't want to continue doing it. I didn't see a future. So I think I stuck with it out of desperation and inspiration. Mm -hmm. I was desperate to find something different and I, and I didn't see anything else other than that. And, and as I was inspired to change my life and I got exposed there in that company to some of the best training ever. I mean, it, it was so mind stretching for me mm -hmm. uh, to, to hear personal development. And, you know, I remember a guy gave me a, he gave me the book Psycho Cybernetics by Dr. Maxwell Maltz. Mm -hmm. And I'd never read a book like that or even seen one. I opened it up and I was just kind of starting and I read the first page or two. And I said, I'll never forget it. I said, what a bunch of crap. And I threw it in the trash across the kitchen. Mm -hmm. And, and uh, about, let's see, in 1981, I think it was, uh, myself and a partner owned the seminar rights to psycho cybernetics <laughs> and thinking real rich. <laughs> it all came full circle, huh? And I read the book 30 times in 30 days. So I got really, to know yeah, very well. So, and taught classes on it and taught other people to teach classes on it. So, so it was, what changed between the version of Jim that throws it in the trash and the version of Jim that reads it 30 times in 30 days? Well, I, you know, I just never been exposed to anything like that. Mm -hmm. I thought what self image and what's, you know, uh, self esteem. And I, I didn't know it. I mean, I never heard anything like that before. So I mm -hmm. just thought, I don't understand this. I'm a 10th grade dropout. So uh, they were writing above my pay grade, I guess. I sure. Know. Sure.
So, okay. So we, we've become successful in this business and, and, in, and in this business, you're saying you're exposed to all sorts of amazing training and is, and that's where you got introduced to personal development as well. Right. Um, what happens after that? So you've had a level of success that you never thought was possible. You kind of defied your peer groups. My guess is lineage to first generation entrepreneur, I would assume. Yeah. Um, so you broke all, you broke all the barriers along the way. Then what happens? Well, uh, in that company, when <clears throat> that direct sales company, I met Jim Rohn. And Jim was the uh, trainer for that company, mm, uh, virtually okay. unknown, except within that company. And I remember, never forget, sitting in the room with his first three-hour seminar, mm -hmm. I took 16 pages of notes. And then I started following him around. I lived in Oklahoma at the time. Then I went to Arkansas, and I went to Texas, and I went to Kansas, and I went to Colorado. Just Anywhere to hear him he speak? Was, I would go wherever he's speaking in the company. I would go there wow. within about a five or six state region. Mm -hmm. And one day he goes, where do you live anyway? <laughs> Wherever <laughs> you do, the, pal. <laughs> taking the same 16 pages of notes every time I'd go. And, um, and we became best of friends. And, and then that company um, went out of business about two years later. Okay. And Jim, Jim moved to another, uh, I, I didn't know where he moved to, actually. We both moved. I moved to Arizona. Uh, well, I'd, I'd, moved to, um, I'd moved to another part in Oklahoma right before that. And then um, I was going to build a, a, a warehouse building in Arizona. So I went to Arizona, uh, and, and Jim and I had lost contact completely. We had no phone numbers, nothing. So I go to Arizona, and I'm looking at some property, and I walk into uh, a, a, a restaurant one morning to have breakfast. Mm -hmm. And there sat Jim Rohn. I'm going, wow. I said, What's the well, chances? What brings you here? And he said, well, I live in San Jose now. And he said, I came here to look at some property because I'm going to build a couple of houses. I'm going, well, I'm going to build a warehouse. <laughs> so we got to talking and, and he said, well, why, not, why don't uh, we start a business? Join me in business and let's... Uh, let's start a seminar production company. And I said, well, I don't, I don't know what that looks like. I've never done that. And he said, well, you promote me and I'll do the seminars. And so it had just evolved from there. And gosh, we, we had, I don't, we had, we probably had months of 20,000 people going through our events, wow. um, maybe more in some months. Uh, Jim was so busy. And then I started doing workshops and things as follow-up. And that's how I phased into the speaking business. But yeah, Jim and I were partners for about eight years started a seminar business mm -hmm. and you guys both found yourself in a diner in Arizona unexpectedly. Yep. Yeah. So I, I want to ask how that evolved, but one thing I've got to comment on Jim is that I'm noticing this theme, like you working in the factory and then an opportunity is presented and you go all in on this opportunity. You don't, you don't go halfway. You don't say I'm going to work at nights and weekends and work to the factory during the day. Then you meet Jim Rohn and you go, I could learn something from this guy. I'm going to take 16 pages of notes and then I'm going to follow him around state by state just to hear what he has to say. I'm seeing this trend of like, you go all in. Is that is that a trend throughout your life? Yes. And, and it has been uh, ever since I was with Jim because, you know, I, I love this business and I love helping people and I love seeing the results that it gets for people. And, you know, I've developed some pretty interesting um, concepts and techniques that nobody else is doing that, uh, that help people to get rid of the, the blocks that mm -hmm. actually stop their success in any area of their life. It doesn't matter whether it's money or relationships or losing weight or relate, wh whatever it might be. Um, people have, they have mental blocks that, that stop them. They don't need motivation. They don't need positive thinking. They don't need the law of attraction. They need to stop and look inside and discover what it is that's holding them back. And we all have it. We should, it I'll, we sure I'll give you an example. Yes, like. please. Let's do I was just about to ask you, can you give us an example, Jim? Okay. The, uh, j just, uh, just a few, well, about two weeks ago, I was uh, coaching this fellow, just started, uh, first session. And I said, tell me, tell me why you need coaching. And he was an entrepreneur, said he was. And he said, well, I've started nine businesses and all of them have failed. Mm -hmm. I said, really? I said, so what caused them to fail? He said, well, I had a business partner in all nine of them. And it was the business partner. I said, 
in every one of them? He said, yep. I said, well, what did they do? And he said, I don't know. Some of them screwed me over for money. Others took money that didn't belong to them. Others didn't show up and do their part of the, the job. And I ended up having to do everything. He said, and they all failed. I said, wow, that's unfortunate. And I said, tell me about your childhood. He said, what about my childhood? What does that have to do with my business? I said, I don't know, maybe nothing. He said, no, I don't think that that has, has anything to do with my business. I said, come on, where were you at four and five years old? He said, well, quite frankly, he said, I got abandoned as a child at five years old. And I said, well, do you see any correlation between that and your business? He said, no. <laughs> and I said, well, yeah, back when you got abandoned, you wanted somebody with you, right? You felt alone. So you started nine businesses and you didn't want to feel alone. So you took on nine partners and they all abandoned you, just like you got abandoned as a child. And I said, you're just repeating the pattern over and over and over. I said, you're hoping that that's going to help the way you feel or the way you felt as a child that you've carried with you for the rest, for the remainder of your life until now. And I said, you see a correlation? And he went silent for about 60 seconds. Mm -hmm. And finally came back and he said, oh my God. He said, I would never, ever have considered that. He says, I'll tell you right, right now, he said, I've already got my money's worth. He said, it's powerful. <laughs> so powerful. You know, it's it's understanding that that we have these mental blocks because we get programmed from birth to death. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I saw an interview with Tony Robbins and a robot a while back. If you ever you get a chance to see it, you probably Google it and find it. Mm -hmm. They carried on a conversation back and forth. And one question he asked the robot, he says, um, what do you know about quantum physics? And she says, it's a, it was she, her name was Sophia. Mm -hmm. I guess it was a she. <laughs> he says, um, she said, well, I don't know much of anything about quantum physics, but if I study it, I'll know everything about it with emphasis on everything. And I thought, Wow. I guess that's true. If you program it in, then you know it. Mm -hmm. And I'm thinking people are different. You're different than I am. We may have a little different accent. We've been raised differently. We're in a different part of the country. We may eat differently. We think differently. And everybody's unique. But the last question he asked, he said, what's the difference between a robot and a human? And she says, not much. <laughs> <laughs> and so when, but when you think about it, you know, as a child, you've got your parents and your parents said, that's a blue sky and that's an airplane and that's a tree. And, uh, you know, you learn to walk and you learn to talk and you learn to, uh, express yourself and you learn to cry when you need something and you, you get programmed with all of this stuff. Mm -hmm. And, and, and as we, you know, we get into the ABCs and, how many people could sing the ABC song right now? I mean, pretty much everybody, mm -hmm. because we get programmed to do that. But along the way, we also get programmed for things that aren't productive. For sure. Now, the productive side of it would be hard to live our lives without it. You know, walking and talking and driving a vehicle is a good example. You wouldn't want to go get in it every time and say, well, how do I drive this thing? You're programmed to drive it. And we're programmed to do the things that we do. Um, and on the other side of that, we have programs that aren't supportive, mm -hmm. either through emotional impact, like the fellow that got abandoned sure. or through repetition, like the woman in one of my classes, she said, I could, I can never be successful financially because of my father. And I said, what about your father? She said, well, he verbally abused me from childhood on up until I left home. I said, how did he abuse you? She said, he just told me I'd never amount to anything. I'd never measure up to my siblings. You're not going to ever be successful. And I said, so he's the reason you can't be successful. Yep. I said, where, where is he now? She said, well, he died 10 years ago. Mm -hmm. I said, well, who's abusing you now? She said, I don't understand that question. I said, well, he's not here. Who's abusing you? She said, I don't understand. And I said, well, think about it. I came back again in about 15 minutes to her and said, did you come up with the answer? No. 
It took five times me coming back. And finally she goes, you mean I'm abusing me? I'm going, what do you think? I don't know. I said, well, keep thinking. <laughs> Came back the last time she says, oh my God, I'd never even considered. She said, I'm carrying on his legacy. Mm -hmm. I'm carrying on what he did to me. I'm doing it to myself. Mm -hmm. She said, well, how come I can't see that? You know, and that's the problem. We can't see what we what we need to change most of the time. Sometimes we do. Mm -hmm. but a lot of times we don't. And maybe you can see it in others, but it's hard to see it in ourselves. So it's that's the power what of I do basically is to help people, you know, discover what it is that's stopping them. Mm -hmm. And and that way, if they if they act upon that, now it's a conscious choice that they do it. Yeah, and, it's a decision versus just programming. And then I show them how to break the cycle. I don't care if it's abuse that they're going through physically or lack of money or whatever it is. Um, there's there's a block that stops them because there's plenty of money out there, mm -hmm. plenty of opportunities for success. It's just that we we have mental blocks. We don't see it. Sure. And that's the power of coaching. That's the power of reading these kinds of books and going to seminars. I'm a fan of all of the above. Mm -hmm. um, it's because it highlights what our programming is and then it makes it a choice. If we don't know it's a choice, we just think, oh, well, this is, my father was this person, so I behave this way about money. I had this terrible experience, so this is why I do this, um, you know, this particular behavior. We, we rarely use that for the power of good. We're like, oh, this will excuse my poor performance, my bad behavior. But when we recognize that that's a choice, that we can choose a different story, choose a different narrative, and we can have a completely different life, then we take the power back. In that scenario with the gal, she's given her dead father all the power over her financial stability. And yeah. and I think that's the uh, uh, that's that's a piece that a lot of us are missing unless we go down either the personal development road or journaling. There's lots of ways that it can be done, but that we've given our power away to so many other people. And sometimes yeah. it's to narratives that were handed to us when we were kids or teenagers and we're like, "Well, I'm just repeating this narrative that at any point we can choose differently." Yeah, I mean, my, uh, a salesperson, for example, they go into uh, uh, an office to make a sales presentation. And let's say they do two or three in a row and they get two or three no's in a row. Well, the next one they go into, they're not going into it with a clear mind. They're going into it, mm -hmm. looking through those rose colored glasses of the past three presentations they just made, mm -hmm. most likely even anticipating getting another no or hoping they don't, you know, but but they still do because they're they don't realize that you've got to you've got to let go and and, and cut the tie mm -hmm. um you know it's it's like fear is uh it, it's only real if you make it real it's a made-up story um somebody asked me the other day they said well what if a what if you got a, a bear or a lion chasing you through the woods isn't that real fear i said no you're making it up i said he hasn't caught you yet <laughs> so you're making up in your mind what's going to happen if he catches you. I said, mm. but I'd probably run too. <laughs> sure. <laughs> but, but sure. you know, how about making up something more empowering? Mm -hmm. It's just changing our focus mm -hmm. and, mm -hmm. and being able to, well, you know, I learned over years, I, I, I interviewed 12 mega millionaires a few years back, uh, one billionaire and everybody, all 12 of them had to start with nothing and they had to have earned at least 200 million dollars okay so self-made okay yeah now all in different industries it's all okay. self-made so i interviewed all these people and after about the third interview i'm thinking you know they say it in a different way but they have they have about five to six traits in common mm -hmm. and and i started looking at myself and i thought well do i have those traits and i mm -hmm. thought that's what drives me you know, that's, that's what inspires me to keep going. And sure, let's talk well, about some of them. Yeah, one is, I mean, they're, they're simple. But yet, if you don't understand them, and, and the concept behind them, uh, you can get stuck, and, and it can throw you off course. So one is, a, is a desire to become more, mm -hmm. you know, whether it's having more or, um, you know, becoming financially free or whatever, uh, a desire to become a better person. Mm -hmm. in some way but 
let's just take money, for example, because most of the people listening here are entrepreneurs. So uh, you could go out on the street corner anywhere in, in, in any country and probably in the world and ask a thousand people if they'd like to make more money. And everybody would say yes. Even the person already making a million a year is looking to make two million a year. Mm -hmm. So um, so they have the desire, but how many really do? Mm -hmm. The reality is that most of us spend about 80% of our waking hours going after money. You know, average working person, whether they sure. have a job or entrepreneur or whatever. But the reality is that 90% of those people don't have enough. Mm -hmm. So they're spending 80% of their waking hours and they don't have enough. That's sad, if, if, if you ask me. Mm -hmm. So the desire is not enough. So you got to take it to the next step. And that's called decision making. Mm -hmm. And where people go wrong there, a couple of things. One is, let's just say this circle here is a, a firm decision. Like I made when I sat in that meeting that night, I'm going to be successful at this. and I'm going to get rich. Mm -hmm. And you quit the factory. Yeah. So I like quit the next day. Gotcha. Okay. Yeah. I had yep. invest four. I didn't tell you. I had to invest four thousand dollars, and I only had nine dollars. <laughs> and nobody I knew had money. I went to twenty three banks and loan companies to, for I find, before I found one that would loan me the money. Do you had yeah. unwavering faith? Was it <laughs> unwavering faith in yourself or in the uh, system they presented? Or were uh, you just too probably, dumb and crazy? Probably more, <laughs> probably more of the system. Okay. Uh, but but I had determination. I had tenacity. I just sure I wouldn't give up. Um, and I didn't know what I was going to do. It was the last one on the list that, that I could find that, that loaned money. The last bank. Um, yeah. Okay. So, so you had a circle and you so gave the, the yourself no way out. Decision. Mm -hmm. But most people leave just a little opening in that circle. Mm -hmm. And that's their escape route. Mm -hmm. uh, that's their excuse as to why it wouldn't work. Backup plan? Is it kind of that as well? Of how okay. I can back out mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, and, and, and save face just in case it doesn't work. Mm -hmm. um, so that decision has to be a decision that doesn't allow for anything less. Okay. And if you want to be, let's say you want to make a million dollars, you want to be a millionaire or 10 millionaire, whatever. I don't, mm -hmm. I don't even know today how much what you know if a million is enough money for anybody sure <laughs> uh, but let's say you want to be a millionaire do you go look for the opportunity before you decide or do you decide first and the answer is you decide first mm. it's like people say well when i become a millionaire i'll feel like one no as soon as you feel like one you'll become one mm -hmm. uh, that's that's a fact because what happens when you make a firm decision, it changes your mindset. And a mindset determines how you show up to the world. Mm -hmm. And it determines how the world shows up for you to support you. Mm -hmm. And it determines what you see in the world. If you don't need to make a million dollars this year, you're not going to see opportunities. Why would you even look for them? Sure. But if you're determined to make a million dollars, opportunities are everywhere. And they'll come to you. So you were determined before that person came, that opportunity, when you went and saw that business present, you were already determined at that point to be rich, which is why you jumped on this opportunity. Mm -hmm. You'd made the decision long before then. And I learned a lot of that as I went through too. And looking back, you know, that year in my life where I lost everything, mm -hmm. one of the best years of my life. I mean, mm -hmm. not then, but now. Sure. Looking back on it. sure. And, and, you know, people say, well, how do you handle rejection? I'm going, I already did that. Yeah. <laughs> 3,650 times. How many people have you been rejected by? You know, mm -hmm. so you learn that it's it's not about the people. It's 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 just it just is what it is. Some people will buy, some people won't, you know. Mm -hmm. Just what it is. So you got to you have to have that firm decision. I don't care if you want to lose weight or make money or have a better relationship or whatever it is. Mm -hmm. Um that that decision determines how you show up and how the world sees you. Sure. you want to go out and raise capital, you better have that confidence and that mm -hmm. mindset for somebody's because they're going to invest in you, not your product. For sure. And people can so, perceive that. So, okay. So de desire was first, but we know desire is not enough. We heard, you know, this firm decision-making be all in. Mm -hmm. um, what are some of the other traits that you noticed? The, th the third one is you have to take action. 
Take action. Okay. And a, and a good entrepreneur, you can overanalyze. <laughs> yes. uh, and a lot of people do. Mm -hmm. And But a good entrepreneur doesn't overanalyze. They make a decision, they shoot from the hip, and mm -hmm. they take whatever actions they can take now while in the process of setting things up. Sure. Instead it, of, well, I'm going to set everything up and get it perfect. Well, yeah. you'll never get it perfect. Perfect so. is an illusion. Yeah. It, it, it's funny because just a week or two ago, one of my clients had asked me, what's the theme I noticed in all high performers? You know, people that have been very, very successful in their business or even their corporate career, but what was the theme? And I said, I knew it right away, speed of execution. Yeah. And I'm just thinking yeah. this is exactly what you're talking about is yeah. they don't wait for all the data points to be clear. 80% is good enough because perfect is just an illusion. We never get there, but we can die trying. Um, yeah. So I love that this is your third point. That's the third. And then the fourth point is you have to be bold. Mm. In today's world, you're going to have to put yourself in the spotlight because the spotlight's not going to come and find you. So <laughs> you, you know, opportunity your... doesn't just knock <laughs> and you just you just sit on the couch waiting for it to show up. Yeah. And you got to you got to show up as, with confidence mm -hmm. and and um, show up as a key person of influence in your field of business. Mm -hmm. Even if you're not if you're just starting, you have to show up that way. Mm -hmm. And and that requires some level of boldness. Mm -hmm. People say, well, I'm not successful yet. How can I do this or that? You got to feel that way. And you sure. got to know beyond a shadow of a doubt, you got to have the mindset that people cannot resist you. Mm. And they won't if you have that mindset. I'm telling you, that's it's so important to, I mean, I did things back then. I didn't know I was being bold. I mean, I, <laughs> I remember one time knocking on a door. I needed my 10th person for the day. Mm -hmm. So I see this old house. It looked like something out of a movie in the twenties or something. And it had a screen door and had a big hole in the screen door right by the handle. And then it had two steps going up to the house. So there was no porch. So you actually had to open the door and go up the steps. So I got the bright idea. I'm going to go door to door and, and uh, recruit for my business. So I, I go and knock on the door and I'm, I'm standing down below the steps. So I'm looking right in that hole in the screen. Mm -hmm. And the door opens, and all I see is a great big hairy belly button <laughs> through that hole. <laughs> I'm looking like that, and I look up, and here's this guy, great big guy, uh, overweight, uh, big stomach sticking out. And he said, what do you want? <laughs> I'm going, I said, how would you like to make more money each month? And he said, well, I might. Come on in. <laughs> and I was, I was afraid not to, so I come in, and I sat down, and he said, let me get you a beer. I'm going, okay. So. <laughs> Could you get a shirt too? <laughs> yeah. But, uh, you know, nothing. I mean, we, he never joined me in business, but, but it was an experience, you know, mm -hmm. but you know, I was, I was that way. I was, I was bold. I didn't know. I just, maybe it was desperate. I don't know, but mm -hmm. I wouldn't give up on those 10 every day and yeah. how I tracked those 10. We didn't have computers or anything. So I put 10 beans in my pocket every morning. Mm. Uh, uh, dried beans not cooked ones so uh, yeah. every time every time I would talk to a person I'd flip a bean away and I had to I had to mention my product or my service or my business uh in a conversation and I'd flip a bean away wow and that's how I tracked it and I didn't go home until the 10 were gone so what do you so. think gets in the way from people so I heard you mention bold and I heard you mentioned confident a few times mm -hmm. Jim what gets in the way of people being bold or confident um that's the next step <laughs> and and that's the ability to to let go of of the past whether mm -hmm. it's a past call you made or, or or your past period to be able to to disconnect and you know like the woman that that was abusing herself or like the um you know the you know, different people, they go, they go through things in their life and they just keep carrying it around. Mm -hmm. So th there's power in letting go. Mm -hmm. What you have to look at is hanging on to this. I mean, let's just say the listeners right now, think of something that's happened in your life that is less than positive, as far back as you can go, something that happened. And if I ask a group that almost everybody gets it instantly. Mm -hmm. uh, so I'm sure everybody here has already gotten one. Yep. And it's because it's in their minds and in their hearts and they can tap into it quickly. It's right there. Yeah. And the emotion comes up with it usually. Mm -hmm. 
And then I ask, I said, okay, give me, give me how many, how long it's been. And some people go three months, five years, 10 years, you know, 40 years, 30 years. I mean, you get, you get it all. The most I've ever heard is 61 years. And, but my, my question is, when that comes up, do you like it? Do you like feeling that? Do you like recalling that experience? And the answer is, is always no. Well, can you see any reason to carry that emotion around? Well, no. Do you see any reason it's not painful or, or stressful to hang on to it? No. Uh, if you could, would, do you want to let it go? Uh, and everybody says yes. Then I get to the next question, are you willing to let it go? Hmm. And I'll tell them, you know, don't, don't, don't say yes until, and, because the next question, uh, you're not going to be able to use this as an excuse for not doing well again. So are you really willing to let it go? And most of the answers are yes. Mm -hmm. I'd say 99%. And the last question is when, when are you willing to let it go? Um, because, you know, we, we all have stuff that happened to us. And what we think is if we hang on to this, it'll protect us from it happening again. Mm. Like a one woman, she said, I want to, I want a loving relationship, but I'm not going to open my heart to anybody <laughs> until they prove themselves that they're worthy. I'm going, well, good luck with that. Yeah. How do you expect to attract a, re a loving relationship with a closed heart? Mm -hmm. You can't, you got to get over it. And they said, mm -hmm. well, it's hard to let go. And I said, no, it's not. Just because I'm holding this pen in my hand. And for you, you younger guys, if you're watching this, that's something you write with. <laughs> <laughs> but if I'm holding this pen in my hand, mm -hmm. does it mean I have to hold it in my hand for the rest of my life? Mm -hmm. The answer is no. You can put it down. Yeah. You can lay it down. And the same goes with anything that's happened in your life. You got to look at it in, in reality and say, is this helping me get where I want to go or taking me in the opposite direction? Mm hmm. Let mm -hmm. them choose. And everybody says, no, it's not helping me get where I want to go. So are you willing to let it go now? Yeah. You and know, I've had people say, well, you know, maybe after lunch or, you know, <laughs> later in the day, let me think about it. Schedule it at 4 p.m. One woman approached me and she said, can you help me stop smoking? And I said, yep. And I said, how many times have you tried? She said, I, I don't know. I don't know how many times. Dozens. I said, what, what method? She said, oh, I tried the chewing gum. I tried the patch. I tried this and that. And I said, what are you trying right now? She says, I'm tapering. I said, oh, so you're tapering off of smoking. She said, oh, yeah, I used to smoke two packs a day. I'm down to less than a pack a day. I said, but you're still smoking. I said, I said first of all, you have to make a decision to be a non-smoker. Mm -hmm. As soon as you do that, smoking is not an option. So are you willing to do that? So an identity shift. Yeah. And she said, yes. I said, okay, then you're, you're no longer a smoker. And she said, that's it. I said, yep. I said, next time you go to light up, I said, remember that. So we took a break for lunch and I see her outside the lobby of the hotel uh, by a little table out there where she's having lunch and she pulls out a cigarette. And she puts it in her mouth and lights it up. And then she looks at it and threw it on the, on the ground and stepped on it. And um, so she came back in and she said, she said, you know, she said, I went out there and had lunch and she got a habit. I pulled mm -hmm. a cigarette out and lit it. Mm -hmm. and she said, you know what? It tastes like crap. <laughs> and she said, I, I couldn't smoke. And that it was that easy for her. Yeah, I'm wow. sure she went through a few things, times when sure. she prayed it or something, but she said, you know, it's so true with, we leave ourselves options and, and the options don't work. You know, mm. you're going to, you want to lose weight. You got to find out why you're hanging on to all the, the extra. One woman had, she needed to lose 180 pounds. 
she had been in, I can't remember how many diets that she'd been on, but it was a huge amount. So I, I took a piece of paper and I wrote down on one side, your benefits of being overweight and your, your, uh, um, reasons, reasons to keep the weight, reasons to not keep it. Sure. And I'd ask her back and forth. I said, reason to keep the weight. No, there's no reason. Reason to take it off. Well, I'd feel better mm -hmm. back and forth. I'd wear a different dress size. I'd look better. I did, you know, this mm -hmm. and that. I filled up three, four pages of a flip chart with reasons to take the weight off. Nothing over here mm. to keep it on. And finally, I, I wouldn't give up. And finally, uh, at, on the fourth page, I said, what's, what's the benefit of keeping the weight on? And she gets a little red in the face and she says, I wouldn't have to have men touching me. Mm. I said, oh, why not? She said, well, I've never told this to anybody. She said, I got gang raped by a football team when I was 13. And she said, I never told anybody, not my parents, nobody. And I went home and I started eating and I, and I told myself, I'm going to get fat. So I'm not appealing to any man. Mm -hmm. Six months time, she lost 180 pounds with no diet. Wow. <laughs> Simply wow. she let the weight go. Yeah. You see what can happen? I mean, our mind is so powerful that we we instruct ourselves what to do every day. And your and your cells will do whatever you tell them. They'll die for you if you tell yeah. them to. You know, it's we're powerful human beings. We just um just don't realize it sometimes. Jim, how did you get there from being in this business that you're going door to door to starting the seminar business with Jim Rohn to, I think you told me before the, the cameras came on that Tony Robbins was one of your sales, sale, part of the sales team. Yes, he was for about five years. How, how do you get from doing this kind of business to then leaning so hard into personal development? Is it just, I really like this stuff. The book I threw in the trash was actually really good. I'm going to get it out and teach everybody about it. Like wh where does this transition happen? Well, um, again, it, it evolved, I think, over the years. Uh, I never, in the beginning, never saw myself as a speaker. Mm -hmm. In fact, it was my greatest fear. Mm. Um, but once I got into it, um, you know, I would always ask myself every time I would do a talk, whether it was a presentation for one of my salespeople to a group like a real estate board or something like that, mm -hmm. I would always leave afterwards and sit for a moment and say, how did I do it? How could I have done it better? Mm -hmm. And I, I was, uh, I loved reading, but I was slow and, and didn't comprehend very well. And I kept thinking about and hearing about speed reading. Mm -hmm. So at one of our events, uh, there's a group in the back of the room after everybody else left sitting at a table. I go back, say, how are you guys doing? And it was uh, like four, four guys sitting there. Mm -hmm. They said, well, I said, what do you do? And uh, they said, well, we market him. I said, well, who, who are, who's he? And he said, he's the fastest reader in the world. Uh, he said, it's, he's in the Guinness Book of World Records. It's the fastest reader in the world. I said, well, I need to get to know you. Yeah. <laughs> he said, well, I do classes on speed reading. Mm -hmm. I said, oh. So I, I signed up and, and he did a 10 lesson class. And I went to four lessons because I'm not a good student, <laughs> but I went to four lessons. And at, at the end of four lessons, I was reading at 28,000 words a minute with 90, about 98 to 99% comprehension. So I was getting it all. And I, I could read a normal book size, you know, 300 page book in probably 10 minutes uh, and get it. Uh, Whoa. I, I didn't read novels or anything like that. These mm -hmm. were self-help books. So yeah, yeah. I read everything. I went through 4,000, over 4,000 books. And and I did, uh, you know, personal development and, mm -hmm. and psychology and religion and spirituality and marketing. And I mean, you name it. I went through it uh, to the point where I could hardly even find a book I hadn't read in the bookstore at the time in my genre. And that's amazing. So that's how, that's what got me started. Then I went through a transition in my life um, about 37 years ago. I kept thinking, why do people not do what they say they're going to do? Mm -hmm. They come to my events. They're excited about it. A few of them do it, but the rest of them, they need, they need to go to another event. They just don't apply what they, what they do or mm -hmm. what they say they're going to do. Mm -hmm. And it bothered me. 
really bothered me. So I, I went through a transition where I was, I'd always thought, you know, I'm teaching people how to be successful and happy. Okay. Well, here I am at that time, I'm living in Sedona, Arizona. Um, I'm financially successful. Um, I thought I was happy, but my now ex-wife and, and two children at the time lived in another part of the country. Mm. And I'm thinking, that's not, that's not happiness. That's not right. Mm. And the more I thought about it, the more I, I thought, I can't do this anymore. I can't teach people this because I'm not really successful. I mean, financially, but I'm not really happy. And, and to me, if, if you're not happy, you're not successful. So I booked a ticket to Hawaii and stayed over in the North shore of Kauai for two weeks. I didn't take a book. I didn't take a journal. I didn't take anything, not a pen, paper, nothing. And all I did was hang out and I hiked the Nepali coast uh, 11 mile hike. And I spent three days on the beach and I only had two bottles of water and a couple of power bars. And I ate that the first day and drank it the first day. So I'm out of water. So I'm drinking out of a waterfall and I spent three days there sleeping on a towel. And it was like new information got downloaded somehow. <laughs> I don't know. It was a pristine environment. Maybe it was fasting. I don't, I don't know, but I just, uh, I started to see that the problem is not speeding people up and motivating them. The problem is to slow them down and get them to take a look inside. Mm. And, you know, the, the, the last and final step um, really had a ma major impact on my life. And, and it probably will the listeners here when you really think about it. Uh, a friend of mine, we used to, we used to exchange books or we'd read the same book and, and, and he might call me up or I'd call him up and say, you know, and we're studying some spirituality and things like this. And he'd go, you know, I'm on, on page 87 and I'm, I'm stuck. I, I don't know. So we'd discuss it for a while. And right before we hung up that day, he said, what do you think the word resourceful means? I'm going, I don't know, man. I said, maybe being more productive, using your imagination. You know, I, I never really thought about it. He said, oh, it's just an interesting word. And that was it. We hung up. So uh, later, I'm on my way home, and I, that word kept ringing in my mind, resourceful, mm -hmm. resourceful. I'm going, why am I even thinking about that? So I get home, and of course, we didn't have Google or anything, so I open up the dictionary and um, looked up the word resourceful. And the definition is once again, full of source. Thought, hmm, that's interesting. So I looked up the keyword source. And it said where all things originate, not some things, but all things originate in source. I'm going, hmm, wow, that's, that could be pretty powerful, depending on what you think source is, mm -hmm. your definition or, or what you're feeling of source. So I kept looking, I went to the bookstore and I, tr I tried to find origin of words and stuff. I couldn't find anything on source. And, and this went on for about, I don't know, a year and a half or so. And I was in England on a, on a tour and I was in this small town and walking down the sidewalk and I see down kind of a little alleyway, I see a sign that said antique bookstore. Mm -hmm. And I'm always intrigued by old books. You know? So I walk in the back door. And, and as soon as I go in, here's this dictionary. It must be that thick. And, and it looked really, really old. Uh, I don't know how old it was. I never looked at that. And um, it said, do not open, do not touch. And I thought, you know, it's probably for the people in the UK, not for me. So I carefully opened it to the S's. And I'm looking down a page and I see some of the same definitions. And I'm trying to find the origin of the word. And suddenly I see one that says source love. And I went, wow, resourceful, once again, full of love. And I thought, you know, when you decide to do something in your life, when you decide to take on a project, when you decide to write a book, when you decide to start a new business, when you decide to get healthy, whatever it is, you fall in love with that. Hmm. And your only other option is to fall in fear with it. 
So once again, full of love, you fall in love and, and think about things that you've accomplished that you set out to do where you, you're so excited about it. And you've got that gut feeling that's tingling inside that you can't wait to accomplish this. Uh, it's kind of like your first love affair. It's like, remember when your first love affair mm-hmm. um, and, you, and you wanted to be with that person all the time and you, you thought you couldn't live without it, you know? And, yeah. Uh, so you're falling in love with something. Then I thought about that for a while and I thought, well, there's a flaw in that. If all things originate in source, where does fear come from? If all things originate in love, where does fear come from? I thought about that for a little bit and I thought, hmm, you know, fear is proof that human beings can create because we create them. And we create them in love. We fall in love with that fear. Think about that. So it's fear. It's love presenting us with fear, saying, if you take care of this, you'll have more of me. Mm. Take care of this fear, you'll have more love in your life. So you fall in love with something, then you're faced with a fear, and doubt creeps in. And that's where letting go comes in. Yeah. See, it's it's such a when you think about it, just such a powerful concept to realize when you're in love with something and, and stay there because you're the one in control. You're sure. the one in, that, that can make a choice to buy into the fear or not. Jim, let me ask you this. Um, as we near a uh, wrap up our time together, if you could tell the world one thing, what would it be? I, I would say, uh, you know, my favorite quote that I wrote was, if you do what you do with love, you'll have, you'll eventually have only what you love in your life. Um, but I'll give you a success principle that I think is very simple, and I try to keep things simple. Um, once you've decided what it is that you want in your life, every action you take from that point forward is going to move you toward that or away from it. Mm. success in anything is that simple we don't live in a gray world we live in a black and white world it's either taking you toward it or it's not um and somebody asked me one day they said if somebody's habitually late for an appointment what do you think that means and i said well it's either an act of love or an act of violence they said really i said it's not an act of love. Well, it's not violent. I said, well, it might be to the person sitting there waiting. Self-sabotage. It's definitely <laughs> sabotaging. Disrespecting them. Yeah. <laughs> so, so to me, everything moves you in the direction you want to go. And, you know, I don't, I tell people, I don't want you to believe me when I say to let go of something and what it'll do for you. I want you to try it because it will work the very first time you do it. Um, you just cut the tie and maybe it'll pop up again. Maybe not. Mm-hmm. I mean, I've had people where they they've gone through stuff and, and they they're done with it in 30 minutes mm. uh, and others, it may take a little longer because it pops up again. But if you realize that, you know, life is like you go through a path in the field and you get accustomed to going through that path. It's all beaten down. You know, it, you know, every stick and stone in that path to get you over to your destination. But you keep looking over here and you go, well, that's shorter. And it's a little scary though, because it's high grass and there could be some snakes in it or something and Mm -hmm. rocks that I've stumbled over. But if you take that path um, and you continue taking that path and you quit taking this one that you're accustomed to that's not taking you really where you want to go, then that's going to wither away from lack of attention. That's the benefit of, of letting go mm. um, and starting something new. And when you start something new, you're going to be confronted with discomfort. Uh, you just will. Yeah, for sure. Every new life level, every new income level requires a different you. For sure. And if you're not willing to endure that pain, um, then you're probably not going to get much, uh, much further than where you are in that area of your life. You know, unfortunately, yeah. a lot of people just say, well, give me a bag of chips and a TV remote and I'll 
complacently live out my life and complain about what I don't have. Mm -hmm. uh, but what do we live? I mean, yeah. to me, I mean, it's okay if that's what you like, but uh, it's not what I like. <laughs> There's another way to do it. Yeah. I hope you love this video as much as we did. We've set up the next one. So if you're ready to get to that next level, join me in the next video.